let's talk about inclusivity. When I talked to these panelists, um, it was clear right away that we would no way kind of finish off this conversation in one hour. Um, these six folks are um, very passionate about the topic and also working in the trenches every day, <laughs> discovering those stories from underserved, underrepresented communities and um, telling them. So let's start from introductions from each of you. Maybe we can start with Miami. Uh, hi, I'm Mayumi Yoshida. I'm an actor, director, writer in BC. I'm from Tokyo, and I just made a short film through Tell Story Hive called Akashi, and uh, it won a BC Grand Prize, and I've just been touring around with it. I'm really happy to be here. Okay, so you get... My name is uh, Running Wolf, Kentlu Bakakin, Doreen Manuel. I'm the program coordinator for the Indigenous Independent Digital Filmmaking Program at Kapalina University. I am of uh, Sequapmik and Tanaha ancestry. Good morning. I'm Shirley Vercruzzi. I'm the executive producer for the BC and Yukon studio of the National Film Board here in Vancouver and working in animation and documentary short form to feature length in both of those. Okay, Nitsikwa Nistu Anagoki Kaks Kitua, Itamaks Kanutani, Amitsukimi. My name is Cowboy Smith. I come from the Blackfoot Confederacy in southern Alberta. I'm a filmmaker, director, writer, stuntman, you name it, I do it. Foosball champion. <laughs> we'll see about here. that. Happy to be here. <laughs> Happy to be here. Um, my name is Emily Best. I'm the founder and CEO of Seed and Spark. Um, we're a crowdfunding and subscription streaming platform dedicated to making the entertainment business more diverse and inclusive. Uh, my name is Jem Garrard. I'm a writer and director of film and TV here in Vancouver. And what did you just make? Oh, uh, with Tell Us, I was like, just now? Or? <laughs> uh, I, I just made a show called Android Employed with you guys. Yeah, Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so I want to read you a quote from one of my favorite writers, a Dominican-American writer called Juno Diaz. So he says, you guys know about vampires? You know, vampires have no reflections in a mirror. There's this idea that monsters don't have reflections in a mirror. And what I've always thought isn't that monsters don't have reflections, it's that if you want to make a human being into a monster, deny them at the cultural level any reflection of themselves. And growing up, I felt like a monster in some ways. I didn't see myself reflected at all. I was like, yo, is something wrong with me? But the whole society seems to think that people like me don't exist. And part of what inspired me was this deep desire that before I died, I would make a couple of mirrors. That I would make some mirrors so that kids like me might see themselves reflected back and might not be so monstrous for it. I just really love those words. I think it um, really nails why representation is so important. And on top of this kind of spiritual and moral importance of it, we're seeing more and more that there's a strong economic case for making racially inclusive movies. We've seen tie in the last couple of years, um, movies with diverse casts do consistently better at the box office than their non-diverse counterparts. Um, if you think of examples like Get Out, Hidden Figures, Girls Trip, they're just killing it with ticket sales. And yet, we know these things, this information is out there, and there's still a lot of work to do in our sets and in our cultural institutions. Um, this year, I would really recommend everyone to check out this report that was released by USC Annenberg's Media, Diversity, and Social Change Initiative. And they looked at the 900 highest grossing films from uh, 2007 to 2016. So um, of the 900 films that they looked at, there was 1,006 directors who were hired. Um, I want to ask the audience, how many, how many do you think were women? It's pretty low. That's a clue. Pardon? OK. So everyone's pretty pessimistic. <laughs> it was um, 41 of those films were directed by women, and it was 34 unique uh, female directors. Uh, 5.6 of those directors were black or African American. Uh, only 3% were Asian or Asian American. And uh, three, three were black or African American women, and two were Asian women. Um, if we look at other kind of, um, key creative roles, women made up 13.2% of writers, 
20.7% of producers and a tiny 1.7% of composers. But don't worry, guys, that was a 2% gain over the previous <laughs> decade. So at this rate, we'll reach gender parity in the year 2250. Is that soon enough for you? <laughs> I have some more depressing stats, but I think let's just hear <laughs> from these very cool, um, very smart, creative individual artists. They're here to share their perspectives and hopefully open up ways that we can bring communities on the margin onto the screen. So uh, let's start again with Miami. Um, tell us, <laughs> tell us about Akashi. Like, um, this is your first film, and tell us uh, it was. So if you haven't seen it, it's a short film and it's told mostly in Japanese, mm -hmm. which is pretty unique to find, even in this Canadian film landscape. Can you tell us? How about let's start with what was the story that you wanted to tell, and how did you get there? Uh, the story I wanted to tell, it's actually based on a true story and uh, of my, me and my grandmother's story. And um, it's about, the story is, it evolves around uh, this character, Kana, and she gets a phone call. She lives in North America from Japan. And she gets a phone call that her grandma passed away. And then she goes back and then she reflects upon the most intimate conversation they had together and the secret that grandma revealed, which was that Grand, grandpa, grandpa had had an affair their entire marriage life. So, um, yeah, the story kind of starts from there. And my grandmother was actually passing last year, and she unfortunately did pass away. But uh, I just thought, I actually wrote a play before writing a short film. And then I wrote the play for the last, the last Vancouver Fringe Festival. And then uh, the Story Hive Female Directors Edition submission call came out. And a lot of my, um, Karen Lamb, who was one of the mentors, she messaged me and a lot of other people kind of messaged me. I don't know how they heard that I might be good for a director. I had never directed a short film before. But I thought, why not? So I submitted and I ended up making it. So that was kind of like really the start of how I got to make the film. And also just kind of, because she was passing, I wanted to make something to um, remember her. And it was really a personal thing. I wanted to make something that, because this story idea had been going in me for like five years or so. And I didn't want to make it before she's, she's gone. So yeah, that was the reason why I made it. And how did you um, pull your cast and crew together? Well, uh, I was determined that um, I wanted to make it a Japanese film. And many people told me that you're going to have a really hard time. This is Vancouver. First of all, there's like Japanese film locations. Uh, one is like a Japanese funeral home. And um, it's supposed there's a taxi driving through Japan. And there's no Japanese cab here, obviously. But uh, finding locations, it was. Uh, tough, but we looked at authenticity, and that's the exact same thing I looked for crew and cast as well, because 90% of it is in Japanese, and um, and as because I'm mainly an actor, and I often see and I work on set as cultural advising for Japanese and dialect coaching for Japanese as well, and many times people don't take time to make it accurate and to make it authentic. And I really wanted to do that with mine because I have full control of it. So um, I was very, very, very uh, adamant about like trying to get Japanese cast, and which I did, which is very lucky. And uh, crew, too, I made sure that there was a focus pillar who was um, the DP. Uh, he, I trusted him, so he's, he's not. Uh, Asian or Japanese, but the focus puller, I had a Japanese focus puller, a female focus puller, because she would understand our acting and would be able to know when to go in and really get that moment. And the same with an editor. We found a Japanese editor. He was still just just kind of finishing up at Capilano University, but I thought it was really important that because the flow of the film needs to be the same as how we talk. And it's not, it's obviously not the same as the way North American films are made, so, mm -hmm. yeah. About working with a mentor and how, 
how that gave you sort of the confidence to be able to tell the story that isn't usually told? Oh, absolutely. So I, because this was my short film first time directing and acting and writing and producing that, um, of course, I don't know if you guys are, I don't know which state you are in, but I'm in a very early stage compared to, I think, all of you guys. That I had so much doubt in so many of the steps. And um, my female mentor, uh, Karen Lamb, who's, an also, who's also an Asian American, Amer well, Asian Canadian, she um, always kind of encouraged me that, no, just follow your gut. You know it and trust what you feel was right. And uh, many times in the process of the filmmaking, I had times where I thought, oh, but this person's more experienced, maybe they know better, but somewhere in my gut, I just felt like it, it's not sitting well, that's not really exactly what I want. And I, and I just remember that um, voice in the back of Karen kind of going, just, just trust your gut. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, okay, so I kind of, I sort of womaned up and said, you know what, I don't like that. I, I actually mm -hmm. think this is better. Yeah. And I know that's not, but your, from your experience, that's not exactly how you would do it, but this is, this is mine, so let me just do it. I didn't mean, I didn't say it that way. <laughs> I wasn't so much of a tear. This is super <laughs> interesting. I just, yeah. just want to put a note on something. Yeah. <clears throat> we are all, in some senses, culturally trained by the history of cinema. Mm -hmm. Right, and the history of cinema has looked sort of one way with a dominant set of characters on screen with a common viewpoint. And like when we talk about moving forward with inclusivity, it's like think about all of the creative opportunity that's been missed by the fact that the lens has primarily been white and primarily been male, mm -hmm. and how much you can change just by changing the gender or race of your focus puller and by changing the gender or race of your director or by changing the gender or race or sexual orientation or ability or age of the editor and the, the different optic you now put, it's like that's something that everyone can do is think about how your, your creative landscape, but also I, it's never occurred to me before that sometimes like women and people of color, we may mistrust our aesthetic because it actually flies in the face of everything that's been made before. Yeah, absolutely. It never occurred to me until you said that. Super interesting. Yeah, <laughs> so actually I have a question for you, Emily. So you're a strong believer in the business case for diversity. Um, so you live that every day at Stephen Spark. Can you tell us um, how you support stories from diverse creators? Sure. So. <clears throat> Um, I want to try to do it quickly because these people are way more interesting than I am. Um, uh, so Seed and Spark is a combination crowdfunding platform and subscription streaming platform. From a filmmaker's perspective, you can uh, raise money, gather audience, and we have built a suite of really in-depth entirely motion picture creator focused tools that are about helping you develop the most direct sustainable relationship with your audience that also delivers you the data that you need to make really smart marketing and distribution decisions. Um, and that's everything from where your audiences are in the world to what social media platforms they prefer to what platforms and devices they prefer to watch on. Um, we connect everything through our own subscription streaming uh, channel and so subscribers sign up for $6.99 a month. They can watch all the movies and shows um, that are streaming on the platform and a portion of that revenue gets contributed to new crowdfunding projects each month based on how the subscribers vote. Um, <clears throat> When we started this, we actually thought that the process of educating filmmakers to empower themselves and use these tools online would kind of take care of the diversity and inclusion problem, and we were wrong. We looked at our statistics at the end of, at the middle of 2016, and we were like, wow, we're doing really well vis-a-vis -vis women, and that's partially because we're a mostly women-run company, and the people who are out there are women, and so women felt comfortable taking a risk on a new platform because they saw themselves in us, mm -hmm. um, but, <clears throat> We were doing terribly vis-a-vis -vis people of color, LGBT, um, ability, age, uh, you, you name it. And uh, then the election happened. Um, and I can't not, uh, as maybe the lone American on this panel, um, acknowledge that that was basically it shifted the entire landscape of the business in a certain way. Because 
what before maybe was not a political act, which was being interested in diversity and inclusion, um, became politicized. And we decided to lean entirely into it because that's the problem that we're interested in solving. Um, and so we said, now, if you're going to come to Seed and Spark um, and you want to use our tools and you want to raise money on this platform, you have to make a public-facing statement about how your project is increasing diversity and inclusion in entertainment in front of or behind the camera. And uh, we saw an interesting thing happen, which is um, some white filmmakers started to say, well, is this platform not for me? And I found that really um, sad to be honest, because diversity and inclusion is everybody's problem to solve, right? We have benefited from, uh, from a certain amount of privilege, and now it is our absolute responsibility to look at the way that we make our work. Um, because you can make a story about, um, you know, in the States it might be a story about like deep West Virginia it's mostly white people there, and they're it, tremendously impoverished. But it might be really interesting to see what happens to the lens of that story if behind the camera you have an incredibly diverse set of people who are making things in a different way. You might capture new things about that story. And the reason I think that's important is <clears throat> if you look at, and you touched on it, um, movies and shows that reflect the actual diversity of the world that we live in. So we're not, it, it, like Girls Trip is actually, an, it, is not the example, because that one is a very, that is an all African American cast, right? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about, and, and yes, those wildly outperform. But like, just movies and shows that just reflect the diversity of the world we live in. We're not asking you to over-index or anything. Um, they have higher... Uh, domestic and international box office ratings. They have higher uh, television ratings if they're shows. They have higher social media engagement. And then most importantly, they have higher return on investment. So can you tell us, now that you've made this shift outwardly that says this is what Seed and Spark stands for, what difference has you, has you seen? Sure. So we went from 60% women in key roles, uh, writer, director, producer, to 85% women. And now it is 50% people of color in writer, director, producer roles, uh, or LGBT. Um, and we've seen uh, a much greater, uh, like, the we, we have a lot more uh, trans projects. We have a lot more um, uh, projects of different ability. And, and the thing that I'm still after, the two places I feel like we still need to go are, um, uh, we need more writers of color. Um, that's still something that we haven't cracked and something we're working on really hard. And... Uh, more old people. <laughs> like my my mother is the consumer we would all like to have. She ravenously watches everything. She loves, she's retired. She loves movies. She watches on her tablet. She watches on her TV. She goes to the movies. She's like the consumer we all want. And she's so desperate to see herself wow. reflected on screen. And I think the challenge is in the digital age where a lot of the tools for empowering creators who don't otherwise get a shot are online. Yeah. Um, we have this gap, right? And um, I would, just for the young filmmakers in the crowd for whom, you know, who are digital natives, like think about what it might do to partner with an older filmmaker and use your skills online and their skills in the world um, to build something. You would be speaking to such an incredibly underserved audience. That's a project that can do very, very well. Absolutely. And these are the opportunities that I think, we tend to make stuff with our friends. Right? And our friends not only are often our age, but they often look a lot like us. And that's part of what has kept the, the sets less diverse. It's part of what has kept the casts less diverse because it's easier to just make it with your friends and make it work than it is to really try to hire and really research and find people that you think will contribute differently creatively. And I would say there is such a strong business case for the way in which doing that work means greater returns, means you get to make your next thing, and so on and so forth. Thanks, Emily. Yeah. So let's shift back to Canada. Doreen, you've been on the scene for a long time. Um, you are a graduate of the Indigenous Independent Digital Film Program, is that correct? Um, can you tell us um, what was it like when you graduated from IIDF and then having worked in the industry for a little while, and then come back, what's, how is it different for your students today? Well, I want to start at a different place than okay. that. Uh, yeah. A lot of people don't realize what our history is in Canada. Um, uh, we were confined by law to stay on the reservations through our early history here. 
and uh, the early contact of Europeans into this country uh, wanted to, of course, take over the country. And so we were severely, um, well, genocide was practiced on us. We were severely beaten and murdered, and our children were put in residential school. I'm a residential school survivor. And I was raised by two residential school survivors who were also raised by residential school survivors. So our family system was decimated. And so you have generations of people raising children who don't know how to be parents. And I was one of those people. I had to read books. I had to look at people that I knew who were good parents just to try to figure out how to be a parent. So when you have a people coming up in this, in this country who have that kind of a history. Of course we weren't involved in the film industry as the film industry grew. How could we be? We were fighting for our civil rights. You know, my dad was one of the civil rights fighters. He, after he started making headway in civil rights, he went on to be the first indigenous person of this entire world to unite the indigenous people of the world. He formed the World Council of Indigenous Peoples. Up until then, there were either very few, there was very few uh, international indigenous conferences going on, but there, they were all organized by non-Aboriginal leaders of like Britain and the colonizers were pulling together the like-minded indigenous people. But my father saw that was a problem and he saw that we needed to reach out to the UN. And so he did that, he did all of that work. And so I was raised, after I got out of residential school, I was raised in that kind of a home, learning and understanding our history. So for me, uh, I'm always searching for a way to help my people. I mean, that was so ingrained in me, it's like every breath I take, it's in every breath I take. So I've spent my life in education. And he always told us to choose our path and that that path be some way that we could help our people. And education chose me. I just kept landing in education. And I was doing things like, um, I went into one community as a principal of a school. It was down in the US and it was 80% using as young as eight years old, crack. And within two years, I changed that community to 20% using, the youngest was 16. That was 24 hour a day work, 365 days a year. Uh, the kids were with me, staying at my house sometimes, with me every weekend, traveling to different events. I was pulling them out of the community. I hired all indigenous teachers. There was just so many different tactics that I used to change that community, and then I burned out. I came back to Canada, totally burned out. But the community had changed. So that's the kind of work and history I come from. So when uh, I decided to take a year off and just live on my savings, I had made some wise investments when I lived in the US, so I came back and had a little bit of money. So I just decided to work out and just like clear my brain. And then I got this brilliant idea to go to film school, because I thought, oh, that's kind of an easy profession. People. <laughs> People take months off of work and just go holiday. So, <laughs> so I went in and um, I took the film program. And then uh, I started getting all these ideas about the things that it could be used for cultural preservation, language preservation, promoting our uh, social and political initiatives, telling our own stories, being part of these broadcasters. And so I went off into the industry and realized how hard it was and how there was no space for us. And I got invited back to coordinate the very program that I graduated from. And it was a long, hard, clawing all the way up the hill. I mean, I love Capilina University, but in the beginning, they were not good to us. And it was like, we never they never bought us a stick of equipment, even our chairs. I had to fundraise and buy them all myself. We have a room full of equipment uh, now, thanks to CTV. CTV gave us a huge grant and supported us, and we bought all this equipment that we still have. Um, some of it's getting outdated, but then I fundraise every year uh, just to buy a new camera. And um, it's, it's been a, a really tough haul. Things that have changed are that I've completely revamped the curriculum. I listen to the industry. What does the industry need? And I try to provide that. And I instill in my students um, a strong work ethic. I was always raised, my father and my mother always told me, if you want to make it in this world, you've got to learn how to play that game. So much better than everybody else. You need to learn how to play that game forward, frontward, upside down. 
uh, you're a woman and you're brown. So you're going to have to learn every single skill out there better than everybody else. And so that's what I tell them. You know, and I make them take every, all the extra programs like the grip, and the, uh, the grip and the lighting program in the summer. And I push them and I push them to attend all these different events and I push them to learn every single skill within the production. You know, I see some women nodding their heads because you know. <laughs> you have to be brown to know that one. <laughs> you, you, the women understand that too. So um, that's one of the, and, and we are trying to uh, incubate a certain kind of um, two things. One is our own genre because as mentioned before, We've been inundated by mainstream media. And where every single country out there, they have this opportunity to have their own cinema in their own country. We don't have that luxury. Because we're so inundated by mainstream media, and we're trying to step back a bit and remember how it was for our grandparents telling story, and take that and figure out how to put it into media. Well, that's why IIDF exists because we're trying to incubate that. We're trying to get our people thinking about that. And there's little programs all across Canada that are feeder programs to IIDF, but also are doing the same kind of work. They're trying to find our way. And our light at the end of the tunnel was Atanajuat, the fast runner, because they were able to do that. They were able to show something very authentic that went out into the world and was highly successful. So there's, there's that whole part of it, and then um, there's this um, uniqueness that happens on our sets. We start with a circle. We are a circle. Our people have traditionally always been people who believe in a co-op spirit. So we, um, we join together in a spiritual force. I'm not saying we're all spiritual, we're all religious, and we don't drink and all that kind of stuff. We have students from every type of lifestyle there, but we still have this spiritual core, this caring about one another. And so on our sets, they're very loving and tender, and we find we work more efficiently that way. And so I tried that model on On the Farm. I worked with Rachel Talley on On the Farm as a cultural uh, liaison, and she asked me to bring the culture onto her set. And so I started us with a ceremony. And that feeling, and because we were carrying a sacred story. We were carrying the sacred story of the murdered and missing women. And I heard time and time and time from crew, wow, this is such a different crew than I've ever worked on before. And that's because it had that, that strength and power. And every time something starts to go wrong, we have a prayer, and it just fixes everything. It makes it all go smooth and beautiful and wonderful. So we're doing a lot of different things at IIDF, and that's just part of it. Thank you for saying that, sharing, I mean, stories and perspectives we so rarely get to hear. I actually want to go to Jen, because we were just talking a bit about what's it like to be a female director mm. on these kind of commercial sets that you've worked on, and then you're kind of going off and doing your own projects now. How do you like to conduct your sets, and what's the culture and the tone that you set? Yeah, um, I think uh, as as a director, you know, you set the tone on set, and I like to, um, you know, I like to have a calm, respectful set, and that seems so simple, a thing, right? But the amount of people I get coming up to me, saying, "Oh, this is." This is a really nice set. This is I, I like this. Is you know this is so different. I'm like well obviously, it's not a usual thing because the amount of people that comment on it and how different it is from other sets and um, it really I I, I try to keep um, try, try to just respect everybody there. And again, it seems such a simple thing, but I've seen time and time again where where it's not. And uh, in its simplest, the simplest way I can put it is what I do is just call out bullshit when I see it. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that on set. Um, as, a, as, a, as a director, um, as a female director, <laughs> you know, one day I'll, I'll just be a director. <laughs> Still a female. 2250. <laughs> Still a female director right now. <laughs> Working on it. Um, um, 
you know, I, I, I constantly have to prove my proficiency. When I get on, so I, I work on a lot of bigger sets, um, and then I do my own projects on the side as well, which I'll speak about. They're a little bit different, but on a bigger set, especially in something if you come into a, a TV show and you're the, the, the cast and crew is, is already chosen, you're coming in, and um, there's, I've, I've definitely seen a difference in how male directors are treated and how I'm treated. And I just have to, uh, I'm, I'm constantly educating, right? And constantly proving my proficiency. And just to touch upon what you said, um, I made sure, you know, when I was, when I, since I was a kid, I know I wanted to do this as a kid, since I was a kid, and I knew I had to learn everything, everything I could. So I've worked as well as a cinematographer and an editor. Um, just so I can know as much as, as you know as possible, because um, I think as a as a female in this industry, you, you can't just be as good as men. You you have to be better, like you do. Otherwise, you, you're not going to get the job right. So I just I would learn everything I could um, about about the process, and even still on set, you know, even coming in uh, having a calm, confident voice. I'm still explaining things more often than I have to, and I'm still getting a lot of pushback from a lot of older white men. <laughs> Let's just say it. But the thing is, um, they, are, they are a minority on set, those voices. And I find that often um, with online as well, in anything like in trolling and things like that, right? Those voices, fortunately, they're a minority, but they're the loudest voices, and it's my job to not allow them to be to, to be the loudest voice there. Um, otherwise, you know, if you allow them to be the loudest voice, it feels like that that is the tone then on set, and that's what everyone feels, and it's not. And so I just kind of make it, you know, my job to 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 be that louder voice. Yeah. Um, and it's exhausting, you know. Like I'd love to just concentrate on directing. But, you know, part of my job is educating on set all the time as well. Yeah. And, um, I mean, just, I actually just, <laughs> I just wrapped a set like five hours ago as well in, in Squamish. This is why I've got coffee here. But, <laughs> um, actually, a really interesting conversation happened yesterday on our last day. Um, my uh, my stand-in, uh, our second team, uh, she, uh, I found out she's an ex-police officer of 12 years, right? And this had been her first job mm -hmm. in film, her first uh, time as a stand-in. And so, um, you know, all day, every day for the entire shoot, she's standing, you know, while we're framing up and she's observing. That's what she's doing, right? But the whole time while we're shooting, she gets to stand there 15 hours a day and watch. <laughs> and so she says to me yesterday, like, finally we get a chance to talk, and she says, um, she couldn't believe how similar it was what I do on set to what it was like for her as a female police officer, and uh, and I was and uh, you know I was asking her to tell me about what she means and just how constantly, no matter what she did, having to prove yourself, prove your proficiency to gain the trust of your male colleagues, and um, and she's you know she said. Uh, she asked me how I, how I handle it outside of what I do, because obviously on set, you know, you have to keep that, um, that calmness, that confidence. But she's like, what do you do? Because it is frustrating. It really is. What do you do to expel that? And she said, because, you know, I thought I was handling it well. You know, every day I'd be dealing with this. And I, I thought after 12 years I was handling it well and, and realized that actually it had been building up inside, and it's, you know, it's uh, unhealthy. And um, I thought it was a really good question, and I thought about it, and I said that, you know, what I do is I write, and I write my own stories, mm. um, and I work really hard to tell those stories. And when I tell those stories, I bring on a team, a cast and crew of people, of diverse people that, um, you know, that they, they really want to tell those stories and be part of that change as well. And uh, that that really is how I, I expel that, those frustrations. Oh, you're a creator. <laughs> uh, Shirley, so you work with the National Film Board. Can you tell us about some of the 
big changes that are happening at the film board level um, on the diversity and inclusion front. Um, so it was right here in Vancouver, I think it was two or three years ago now in 20, Carol, 2015, right? That um, the uh, NFB announced its commitment to gender parity. Um, nationally, so that's 50% of our productions to be directed or led by female creatives, and 50% of our production budgets as well. So it can't be, you know, that the female directors are getting to make short films and, you know, we don't really have that problem so much in documentary, I have to say, so I think it's, it's something that we're really succeeding at, and I think nationally the numbers are really, really good. But then, this past year, we extended that commitment to, by 2020, to have 50% of the key creative roles, um, which would include um, cinematographers, editors, writers, composers, to be at 50% by 2020. I'm so, to Canada. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, we're a national institution. I mean, I, I think, you know, I mean, for heaven's sakes, what, how did it take so long? Is, you know, I've been with the film board about three and a half years, and I'm really proud now to say that we're doing that, but you know, why did it take that long? And, and it's now rolling across to other institutions, so good on us, but we have to do it as well. So we're, you know, we're pushing it and proud to be part of that initiative. And in addition to that, we, um, in June of this year, the NFB published um, its three-year plan to redefine the institution's relationship with indigenous peoples, and it's a very big, um, program and I'm happy to chat with people afterwards about it and I can guide you where to find the first steps of it onto our website. But it is a plan, it's not just for production, it's also from an institutional, like how many people across the country in the NFB are actually First Nations who work with us. Um, and that's a lot of work that we have to do. But again, proud to be part of an organization that is looking at that and going, okay, let's, let's get it going because it's taken a while. And I just want to say, like, on a local level, because this is where I can, you know, have an impact, and, and with the group of creators here and, and partners from TELUS to Doreen's program and other creators that we can work with, is that, you know, for me, I, it's a rather crass line, but it's always like, show me the money, and I'm like, show me the films. And, you know, we've been working hard to um, have films that represent what our whole region looks like. So it's not just what the Lower Mainland looks like, it's what British Columbia and the Yukon looks like. And we look for projects that reflect that. So in front of the camera, what the story is. Um, so the, we originally had a slide that I sent, but I had three um, pictures on the slide. That's cool. I was just gonna say, because you know we sort of picked them because one was Window Horses, which is an animated feature, which of course Anne-Marie Fleming did. And it's the story of um, a Chinese Canadian girl who wins a poetry contest and goes to Iran to discover her roots. And the cast, the voices are, you know, from across the spectrum. Um, and then we also have um, another picture was the Mountain of Skana, which is a Haida fable that the animator Chris Ochter, um, which one is Chris's? So that one there is a picture that um, from the animated fable that Chris Ochter did, which is um, a Haida tale. Chris is a young Haida artist um, working in the animation industry and then got to do his work with us, or we got to work with him um, on this auteur animation, which is wonderful. And it's also screening here at VEF. And then in the middle is The Road Forward, um, which is Marie Clement's, um, yeah, I mean, I love that movie, and it's not because we were involved in it. I think that that is a extremely powerful piece of work created by Marie and her team, and it was our privilege to be part of it. Doreen was in the film. We got to learn so much about the history of the, um, of, of your, the story you told about your dad and, and the uniting, but also just how Marie's vision for taking what she learned as an artist and an activist in her research and how to make that into an entertaining and informative um, and very powerful piece of work that takes us through history but then hands the story over to First Nations activists who are now. 
And I just, to me, that's exactly the kind of stuff that we should be doing. So it's my goal, um, and with the team I have at the NFB here, to be a small but mighty force for all of these kinds of stories and to keep growing them. So that's what we're up to. I just uh, what we consider truly indigenous film is writer, producer, director all indigenous, and that's not happening at all anywhere yet, except in the, sh the little films that are coming out right out of our communities. I mean, at APTN, they still define it as two out of the three. I've been in talks with Telefilm uh, over this last year, was scheduled to go again on Wednesday. We had a big discussion, brought in filmmakers from all across Canada, and there was only three of us at that table saying, no, it's got to be three out of three. We lost the... Uh, we lost that round, but they were saying optimistically, in the future we'll vote with you for three out of three, but even, you know, because Telefilm is at least taking lead from us and saying, okay, well, you guys define it. And that's what we're trying to define it as because I think we there's enough of us out there that we can make that a reality and where there isn't, like what I do with the micro budget, I'm a telephone partner with the Aboriginal Envelope with the micro budget, what I do with my producers, if they don't have the experience and they don't, is I pair them with a non-Aboriginal mentor who will mentor them through the process of that, thereby training them to be producers. I don't think that's a difficult solution. And yet, other people aren't taking that lead. But ultimately, that's what we want. We want our stories being told because we tell it from a different perspective. When you go see Wind River, and they've got some woman playing an Aboriginal person who isn't even Aboriginal, that's still happening in Hollywood. That's ridiculous. And we have so many beautiful, talented First Nations, Native American, female actors that could play that role, they're still doing that to us. They're still defining who we are as Hollywood Indians, and we need to stop that. And the National Film Board, I remember some guy coming to me and pitching me a story saying he was trying to get funding out of NFB, but he has to have an Aboriginal person attached. And so I know NFB is starting to like say, ask, question, ask the questions. We were just talking about that, and thank you for that. Yeah, and I think it's important too because even though like quote unquote where like the um, the road forward is um, what we call 100% NFB film, right? There's no tax credits or that kind of um, in it, so we're technically the producers. But Marie um, was a part of virtually every decision that we made, right? It was you know we were every late late night, every producer kind of thing. Like of course we tried to shield her from the really boring stuff, right? Because she has the creative thing, but um, we try to also, in those situations, everything that she can absorb from a producing point of view if she wants to, right? Because she does have her own company and she is producing, uh, you know, on her next project. And, and that's just so important for me too. Like it's not, even though, yeah, we're technically the producers, um, I would say that we strive to make sure that it's, it's open so that we can provide that Learning when it's possible. You can train some Aboriginal producers in the future as a yeah. goal for you. <laughs> yeah. No, I know exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah, on the right projects for sure. Yeah. Let's let's move to Cowboy, Aboriginal producer, foosball champion, <laughs> community leader. Um, I I see you as very much being part of the next generation of storytellers and part of bringing up the next generation of in Indigenous storytellers. Um, what's your vision for the future and? Who have you seen start to open the doors? Like, who's taking a chance on diverse stories and stories from your communities? <clears throat> well, that's a big question. I know. That's I know. a huge question. I'll try to be, I'll try to be concise. Um, what I'm recognizing immediately, especially this year with uh, Canada 150, sesquicentennial, one of my favorite new words, um, what we're faced with in this country specifically is an identity crisis from coast to coast. And a big part of that comes from the fact that we've not activated the frequencies of the land. And who has the keys to those doors? The indigenous people who've been connecting to the frequencies of the land for ten, tens of thousands of years. And uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Leroy Little Bear, says, you know, we've been waiting in the wings since these treaties were signed, since the first settlers came. We've been holding the space, and we're ready to go. We're ready to contribute. We've been waiting, we've been waiting, we've been waiting. And you can see it in some of, some of these films. The most successful Canadian film of all time is Zacharias Koenig's Fast Runner. 
And I think a big part of that is that's the indigenous cultures we have in this country are really what is, is those elements are gonna be what define us culturally. I truly believe this. Because the, one of the fundamental uh, practices in indigenous culture is to welcome newcomers, is to welcome people to the circle, to make the circle stronger. This is practiced all across the country, and this is something that was first established on the East Coast with the two-row wampum with the Haudenosaunee people and the Dutch. I mean, it was about activating the strengths of everyone's culture and bringing forward, um, in, in a sense, in a lot of ways, the matriarchy, which, which is something that's been brushed aside by toxic masculinity and dominance of patriarchy in our, in our film industry. Um, so what I'm seeing is, you know, like indigenous filmmakers, uh, uh, film, uh, directors of color, women filmmakers, we've all been standing in the wings. We've all been waiting to be activated. And I think there's certain idiosyncrasies in terms of tempo and tone and sensibility that have been missing from a lot of, uh, especially Canadian cinema. Uh, and we're finally activating those elements and we're turning the dials and we're sharpening the focus and we're finding more authenticity across the board, which is really exciting. And I hope we don't, you know, I hope we don't have to wait till what is the year 22, 2250 for this parody to happen. Because, you know, it's, it's important to have that diversity because, you know, if you have a one-sided narrative for much longer, the identity crisis that we're facing here today is going to turn into, um, you know, more, more toxicity. Sorry to the Americans in the room, but what's going on in the United States is crazy. I don't know uh, what the hell happened down there with that election. What the hell happened down there? Um, a, a boil burst. <laughs> something went. A boil gone. that we've been ignoring for but, I mean, it's, too long. I think it's a solidarity bubble burst about to happen down in the United States. And we as indigenous people, I'm from the Blackfoot Confederacy. Okay, the border crossed right through our traditional territory. So we're dealing with both, you know, both sides of uh, of this genocide coin, and we're constantly trying to have to um, articulate our thoughts, hold the space, keep it together. Uh, whilst still trying to manage the intergenerational trauma we all face. And we have to do that uh, in order to be successful, especially in an industry that has a bottom line across the board, bottom line business, your deliverables, your deadlines. You have to hit all of these markers and all of these check marks. I've been approached by many different uh, film organizations and companies, private companies, and I feel tokenized immediately because they want to get that check mark. We want the indigenous or aboriginal person so we can get this, we can access this funding. And I'm thankfully saying no to a lot of producer directors. I'm looking and waiting for the right circumstances. And a few years ago, I, I found the right collaborator with Chris, Chris Chung, Chinese, Chinese Canadian filmmaker. And we decided to really attack that conversation about who are we and what is our history with Elder in the Making. Yeah, thank you. And OK, so as you can see, so many more conversations to have coming out of this. Um, I think we have five minutes, so I'd like to open it up to the audience to see if they have any questions for any of our guests here. Thanks, Kevin. There's a question up here. Um, I can jump. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, Thanks. For Emily, uh, we were just talking, you were talking very briefly about um, our older community, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. I mean, so Did hear the she's, she asked about the, the um, inclusivity around age. Um, and uh, sure, you can actually just go look at the, at the gross box office of films that starred uh, primarily actors over the age of 50. Um, just in the last couple of years. And they're films that um, maybe not everyone's heard of, but that went out on the, um, on the festival, or I'm sorry, on the like uh, independent theater circuit and just crushed for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And, weeks. Um, and there's one in particular, and of course I can't remember what it's called right now. It was, uh, I think it was called uh, Quartet. Um, from maybe two or three years ago. And that was the one that people were sort of looking at, but like, you know, there's, there's uh, for the best exotic marigold hotel, these sorts of things that are like kind of splashier, uh, bigger, but, but even smaller films starring older actors just tend to do extremely well. Um, and, uh, and you can also see it in some of the series um, 
there's several the series that's st- you guys, my son woke me up at 5.45 this morning, and I remember no proper nouns right now. Uh, so the, the, the series starring Lily Tomlin, um, there's just like a whole Grace stretch. And Thank you, Grace and Frankie. <laughs> God. I love that show. Uh, yeah, so um, I think it's, it's uh, the statistics are, are less important than actually the action that it takes. I was, I'm, I'm sort of overwhelmed by what I have learned from my fellow panelists just in this last... Uh, 45 minutes around um, the opportunity for taking cinema to a new place by changing how we collaborate. Like how we approach our sets, um, how we view the environment we've cultivated. Um, I don't know how many of you have been um, lucky enough to read any of the recent press about Harvey Weinstein. Um, Unfortunately. But I think it's a really important moment in our business where we have to look at it and say, we have allowed this to be a toxic, hierarchical place that has not contributed to great creativity. Instead, it has, it has actually contributed to the disenfranchisement of like most people. Um, if you want to talk about it in terms of percentages. And it has limited the creative capacity of cinema. And we now are sitting here with the social conscious that we have right now, with these revelations being made, and a moment to say we can do things differently. And there's this phenomenal expertise in Canada. Um, I think in the US, we're still trying to figure out who to turn to. um, Because we don't have national boards that have set forth I'm going to say the word that in the US you can't say, which is quotas. Like, we're just going to fund 50% women at 50% funding. Like, we won't, we can't say that in the US. We also don't have a governing body to say that, and ours wouldn't right now anyway. But the the point is, like, you have this incredible moment and opportunity, and I think it's actually time for some, like, you're right. We we get obsessed with the deadlines and the bottom lines, and what are we making right now for, for what deadline? But there is a really important moment of reflection to be made about why are we making what we're making and how are we setting it up for what purpose um, into the future. And there is enough evidence right now that making things differently with more diverse uh, casts and crews actually also meaningfully contributes to the really capitalist venture of like making money and making more movies. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is also like expanding the creative potential of the, st- of the stuff that we're making. If I can add a little bit to that really quickly, I'm so sorry. Um, my film is, besides me, it's like the cab driver is late 40s, the grandmother is 60s, and the other woman is 60s. Um, at the beginning, I thought, like, is this, I don't know if, but to me, it was like, okay, well, it's personal, so I don't really care if people don't watch it. <laughs> um, but everywhere I go, they are surprised by the talent of these elder people. And it's like, well, they're, they've always been there. And it's, it's kind of like women in comedy. Like, people are like, wow, women are so funny now. And they're like, we've always been funny. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's not like we suddenly became funny. So, um, but every time I go to these film festivals, everybody are like, they, they're all so touched by it. But then I'm like, well, this is so interesting that in my mind, I had kind of screened it as, oh, it's, it's not going to reach. But these people, these generations that, or it's not just elderly, but like any age, if you kind of find the truth and like the story that are untold, so many stories are untold because of their age or their gender or their race. And when you kind of, it's not, it's a weird way to say target that, but when you find a story that authentically tells like the, the truth in what in, in in their culture then it's surprising how many people resonate and they actually relate and then they find that really interesting and I guess box office or whatnot you know <laughs> I so think that, that I really agree the silver lining is, is there, there's so many more stories to be told mm-hmm. at this point thank you Megan um, Carol Whiteman women in the director's chair um, I want to say thank you to all the panelists because I've been inspired I've been doing this for more than 20 years uh, uh, as well with the women in the director's chair program but what I'm taking away is an inspiration 
uh, to, to, about holding the space. And I kept hearing that from each of the panelists in different ways of holding the space. And I want to turn my attention to you, Megan, and Story Hive, and say thank you for inspiring that with the work that uh, Story Hive is doing in creating community and holding space, because I think that's one of the ways that I'm taking away from your panel uh, to be um, uh, re recommitted to that purpose of creating community and holding space and looking for the people who are waiting in the wings and and uh, and ready to to share their stories so I just wanted to share that that keen observation that that has hit me to the core today so huge yeah. shout out to story hive yeah. <laughs> didn't tell them to do that. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you all so much for um, sharing such incredible thoughts and stories at 9 a.m. on a Saturday. So everybody have a great day, um, and we're all here for the rest. Of, I think everybody's here for the rest of the day, right? All right, so see you out in the lobby. Thanks.